It's from 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll be starting in verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Good morning. Um, I guess I'm in delight. Um, uh, this morning we have, uh, uh, we, we, I'd like to take the time to recognize two special young girls. Uh, they graduated high school and uh, I told them that I would embarrass them a little bit and I have some funny stories to tell about them. But anyway, Tori Sinzone and Tori Bellamy, would you, guys, would you girls please stand up so that the congregation can. to uh, Jim Simpson for putting this together for the girls. So, hopefully, yeah.
All right, so uh, Jim Sinzon, thank you so much for helping with this video. And uh, thank you girls for sharing some of these photos as well. Your parents for sharing some of these photos with us. I'm pretty sure there are a couple you guys probably wouldn't approve. But um, uh, Tori Sinzon is gonna go to Lipscomb University uh, this fall. And Tori Bellman is gonna start at Nagatuck Valley this fall as well, you know. And we just wanted to let them know we're proud of them. And there's a whole congregation here praying for them. And if they ever need our help, some resources, you guys just reach out, okay? Uh, it's okay, Dory, you don't have to cry. <laughs> so um, this morning, I just thought that, you know, I would sort of like share a few words with you guys. With a lesson that is not geared towards Tory and Tory, I guess Tory Square would work, um, but towards young people, you know, and, um, and the families in our congregation. Just a few words of encouragement. Um, I've been privileged to um, to interact with a lot of different young people in my life, you know, and uh, and I've been privileged to be in some of your homes and interact with different families. And one thing that I've learned over the years is that the relationships that exist between parents and children can be very different in every home. You know, it's very different in the way that you discipline your children. You know, it's different in the ways that you teach them certain lessons and how they respond. You know, each child seems to have their own personality. You know, sometimes it's different from the parents. Sometimes it's just like the parents. You know, and, and, and it's different in the way that in certain houses, in certain homes, it's okay to express your emotions and your feelings, and in others, it's not so much. You know, and, and I've, I've just seen that, I just think that it's very different based on what I've seen. You know, so, but whatever the relationships that you have with your children, one thing is for certain, you need to take the time to teach them, you know, to guide them. You need to take the time to, to love them and encourage them in the Lord. You know, this morning I'd like for us to look at a special relationship uh, in the book of 2 Timothy. You can turn your Bible there. We're going to look at the relationship between Paul, between the Apostle Paul and his son, um, Timothy. Uh, Paul calls Timothy my beloved and faithful son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17, Paul says, For this reason I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ. You know, I like that. Paul is saying, Timothy is my son, and Timothy will remind you of my ways in Christ. You know, so often I'd like to believe that your children sort of like paint an, an image of who you are to other people around. You know, so at the beginning of 2 Timothy, when Paul started to talk uh, to Timothy as he's addressing his son, he's his spiritual father, Paul thanked Timothy uh, for his faith. He was addressing his grand, uh, grandmother and his mother. He said, I thank God for your grandmother and your mother because they played a major role in his spiritual development. You know, parents, you, you play a major role in your children's faith. Whether you rea realize it or not, you play a major role in their faith and their future. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother and your mother, and I am persuaded is in you also. Brothers and sisters, faith starts at home. Faith starts at home. The church is very important for fellowship and, and worship and and teaching and evangelism, but faith starts at home. I don't believe that God meant for the church to replace what needs to be done at home. Parents, you have a spiritual responsibility towards your children. You have a spiritual responsibility to teach them, to bring them up in the Lord, to be an example to them. Faith starts at home. Not only bring them here, which is good, but it is your job 
to teach them and pray with them at home, to read scripture at home and, and tell them the importance of being a godly person. It starts at home. And Timothy recognized, um, Paul recognized that with Timothy. Paul recognized that it started with your grandmother and your mother, and now it's in you as well. We see faith being passed down from one generation to another. You know, Paul was a spiritual father to the young Timothy. And after he recognized the role that his family played in him developing spiritually, developing a genuine faith in God, he moved on to what I'd like to call the body of his letter that he's writing, and he started to encourage Timothy. And many believe that 2 Timothy was written towards the end of Paul's life as he was nearing his death. And the first thing that Paul told Timothy, you know, Paul was trying to address Timothy and to encourage him. And before he started to talk to him as his spiritual father, Paul did not want to take away the, uh, uh, the part that his parents played in his life. Understanding that they had a responsibility and they taught Timothy about God and about their faith and passed that on to him. You know, it is my belief that regardless of what ministers, youth ministers, Bible class teachers have to teach your children and your family, we can't replace you in the home. Parents, God wants you to be spiritual leader in your home. Joshua 24, 15, it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you remember that story, Joshua was talking to the whole nation of Israel. He says, you need to choose for yourself. I may not be able to choose for you. Remember all the things that God has done for you, with you. But one thing I know is for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a decision I can make. Parents, you need to say that. You know, so before, after Paul recognized their, the role that they played. Now, Paul is moving on to give a few words of advice and guidance to, Paul, uh, to Timothy. The first thing that Paul says, which is very interesting, keep your Bible open in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Young people, do not be ashamed to testify about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I know young people can talk. And I know you guys can express your ideas. But how likely are we to express our faith to our friends? You know, it's, it's a very important responsibility, not only for young people, but for the entire church. I'm reading this book um, called Unchristian. You know, in this book, the writer, uh, he made a lot of research. And he worked for the Barna Group, you know, the Barna Research Association. And they interviewed a lot of young people and, and young adults in America, thousands and thousands of interviews. And it didn't take long for them to realize that most people in the world have a negative view of the church. And one thing that they realized, most people knew what the church was against, but very few knew what the church was for. They kept on talking, saying, we are anti-this, anti-that, anti-this, and anti-homosexuals, and anti-abortion, anti-people you know, people shacking up. And, and, but very few knew what we sinned for. When we are talking about the gospel, we need to present a gospel of grace, a gospel of peace and of love and forgiveness. The world needs to see that kind of image. Young people, the world needs to see that coming from you. Adults, the world needs to see us showing them the gospel is about grace. About, not about beating people down. It's about forgiveness. It's about loving each other. And we shouldn't be ashamed to spread that to people. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power unto salvation. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. The thing is, you know, once again, having been, having interacting, you know, having interactions with a lot of young people, something that I realize is that young people can be very candid. I know some of you are very candid, especially when it comes to what you believe in. 
Some of you express your opinions and stuff like that a lot, especially on social media. You want to know what a young person is thinking? Follow them on Twitter, on Facebook. Follow them on Instagram. I don't know if I'm saying it right. They express their ideas. They're not ashamed to talk about the TV shows they watch. They're not ashamed to talk about the songs they listen to. They're not ashamed to talk about their friends and what they think about the ones they like or they don't like. We need to do the same when it comes to the gospel. Don't be ashamed to talk about your faith. So what? Some of them don't think you're cool. Talk about it. Don't be ashamed to tweet a scripture every now and then. Don't be ashamed of that. You know, sometimes I just wish that not only young people, but also every gospel believer, every saved person would testify about their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as much as they testify about their political views. As much as we testify about our personal preferences and opinions on social media, I wish we would do that. In Luke chapter 9, verse number 26, the Bible says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. The truth is, things that matter to us in our lives the people that we love, the subject that we are passionate about, we are not ashamed to talk about them. Things that people are passionate about, you will know because they will talk about it. Young people, let your passion for Christ be shown in every aspect of your life, especially in how you talk about him to other people around you. Never be ashamed to talk about God. Never be ashamed to express your faith. You know, if Jesus is not ashamed of me, who is a sinner, why should we be ashamed of him, who's my savior? Let's not be ashamed of that. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel. Let's not be ashamed to tell others about him. You know, and the reason why Paul goes on in verse 9, the reason why Paul says, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Why is that? The first thing is Paul says, you are called according to his own purpose. As long as you accepted Christ, you need to understand that you were called according to the purpose of God. When you accept Jesus Christ in your life, you are called according to his glory. You are called for his honor, not your own. You are called to praise him, not us seeking praise from the world. A lot of times the way that young, not only young people, but most people who are on social media, express their ideas and, and posting pictures. Sometimes some of you will take like 10 shots before you find the right, the right picture to put in there. The right position, the right angle, the right face. Looking for praise from people. Somebody said, oh, only five people like my picture. So what? We're not here to to be praised, to receive praise from the world, at least not that kind of praise. We are here to praise God. We are here to bring honor to God. We are here to glorify God. Young people, do that. Don't be seeking praise from the world. Understand that your purpose is to praise God. You know, right now, graduates are looking into what's next. You know, I know you guys are gonna go to college, but what's next? Going to college is a start. You know, maybe your parents, they want you to not only go to college, but graduate college, get a job, start a family. I mean, way down the road, you know. Amen. Look at Jim Simpson back there. <laughs> Just when you're like 40, you know. <laughs> way there. You know, um, having been, I've been here for over eight years. You know, and... I can't remember who I was talking to. I, I stay in touch with a bunch of the older kids who are here. You know, Jeremy, Sean, Rebecca, Sam, and, and all of them. Many of them are all over the country. You know, and I, I remember I, I've been to several high school graduations. I've been to a lot of college graduations. 
I've done two weddings, and some of them are pregnant now. And I'm like, wow, I'm getting old. You know, it's, to see them grow, did you see the pictures? I mean, I don't know, I mean, Jamie and Tina, they've done a good job saving pictures. They have a picture of her in the belly, okay? How fast they grew up. When I first got here, how old were you? Yeah, 11. And now, y'all going to college. You know, graduates, young people, regardless of your ambitions and desires in life, remember first you are a disciple of Christ. Remember you were called according to God's purpose. You've added on Christ in your life. Whatever comes next, remember you are always a child of God and that will always be your identity. Because God has a plan for you. Whatever it is that you want to do, you want to accomplish in your life, I believe God has a plan for you. When God was talking to the nation of Israel, in Jeremiah chapter 29, he says, For I know the plan that I have for you, plan to give you hope and a future, plan, plan to prosper you, not to harm you. I believe just like God had a plan for the nation, God has a plan for all of us Christians today. God has a plan for all of you young people today. God has a purpose for you. There are several ways to understand God's purpose for our lives. But I believe the main purpose for us is to be holy. God wants us to be holy. God wants you, young people, to be holy. And I know it can be an impossible task, but God wants us to be holy. And everything else will flow from that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 14 and 15, it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Be holy in all you do. You see, young people, young people have a lot of different things that they are struggling with. I understand that. Young people have a lot of different challenges they face in their lives, especially our young people in the church, when they have to go to school and, and, and live in a community with a lot of people who could care less about godly moral behaviors. It's a challenge for a lot of them. I understand that, and I can respect that. According to the Barna Group, one of the biggest things that young people, young Christians, deal with, it's purity. They deal with, they struggle with the idea of being pure. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the brother read it for us this morning. Paul says, do not let people look down on you because you are young, but be an example in purity. What? How, how exactly should we expect our young people nowadays to be an example in purity? That sounds like an impossible thing to do. Let's be real. Guess what? It is impossible. It is. How can we expect you to be pure in a world where sexual immorality is so rampant? I mean, have you been to the mall and see how people dress during the summertime? Have you seen some of the movies that our young people are watching? Some of the music that they are listening to? And sometimes you are listening to these things, they're just dancing, well, I just like the beat. But the words are being fed into your brain. The images you see on the computer, they are sticking up there. Making you believe it's okay to dress this way, it's okay to do this, everybody's doing it, why can't I? Why should I be the one to be pure? It is impossible. It is impossible to be holy in a world that is so wicked. You are right. Because no one can be perfect. No one can be holy. No one has it all together, not without Jesus. That's what we have that the world doesn't. We shouldn't expect the world to live like we do. You have Christ, and the grace of God, I believe, can empower you to be pure. It can empower you to be holy. That's the difference between you and the young people in the world. 
Listen, being holy doesn't mean that you're never going to mess up. That's not what it means. Being righteous doesn't mean that you're never going to do anything wrong. If you, if you, think, I'm at, I'm, if you think I'm wrong, just ask your, your wholesome parents. Just ask them. Just ask. Ask them how many times they done mess up when they were your age. Just ask. Come on, Art, you should tell them. Ask them how many times they fell off track since they became a Christian. Ask them. Ask them what did they do for fun when they were young. Ask them what did they do on prom night. Just ask. They done mess up. You know, it's funny to me, if some of you parents were to start talking to your children about what you did when you were their age, you would have to skip a few stories, wouldn't you? Let's be real. You know, my aunts and, and my uncles, sometimes they, they tell me what my wholesome preacher of a father did when he was my age, and I'm like, this guy, he used to whoop me so bad for doing the same thing he did. That is unacceptable. Some of you are laughing. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And some of you are looking at your kids growing up and you're like, oh my goodness, they're going to be just like me when they're going to... The truth is, my father was right. And he said all the time, I did not want you to make a mistake like I did back then. So that's why they disciplined you. Not because they didn't mess up. They did. Ask Jim and Tina. Ask them. They did. And they discipline you because they love you. Because they do not want to see you suffer or go through the same hardships that they did. You know, so the thing about being holy, a lot of us adults here who have Christ in our life, God calls us to be holy. God calls us young people who have Christ in our life to be holy. Being holy, to put it plain and simple, it's understanding that when you sin, when you mess up, remember to repent and allow Christ to turn your life around and be forgiven. We're not expecting you to never make a mistake, especially for those of you who are going to college. You will make mistakes, period. But when you do, Use your parents as a resource and always rely on God for forgiveness, for strength, and for guidance. Always rely on his word. And remember, you were called according to God's purpose. You were called to be holy. And second of all, you are called according to his grace. You see, you and I, we were, we were not called into Christ according to our works, what, what we do as good Christian in this community. We were not called into Christ, you know, because of who we are. That's not why we were called into Christ. We were called because of the grace of God. The salvation that we now enjoy, it's not because of merit or hard work. It's because salvation is based on grace. You know, I know graduating high school took a lot of hard work. For some of you, there were sleepless nights and countless hours of study and school projects and dealing with school drama and all that. But having, having made it this far in your life, you need to realize it's only by the grace of God that you're here. It's only by the grace of God that we are all here today. We were called according to his grace. The greatest thing you could ever achieve in your life is to accept Christ's free gift of salvation. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 9, Paul says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, to our works, but according to his own purpose and according to his grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. You know, in life, we learn that we need to work hard to make a living. Some of you young people might be in here and your parents already said, you need to get a job. You want your cell phone bill paid? Get a job. 
You want to buy those sneakers for $500? Get a job. Listen, if you, if you want a pair of sneakers for $500, yeah, you need to get a job. Okay? No shoes. I don't care where that shoe came from. It shouldn't cost $500. That's just ridiculous. But anyway, that's, that's my thinking. You know, they're telling you, you need to work hard and you need to get a job. You need to work hard to succeed in life. When you're in school, you need to work hard to graduate. When you get a job, you need to work hard to maintain that job. If you get married, guess what? You need to work hard to keep your marriage. Working hard is a good thing in our society. And we know that. And we teach our children that. It's such a good thing that it's becoming something we just say in day-to-day -day conversation. How you doing? Working hard. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? Just working hard. Oh, I'm working hard. I spent six hours watching Netflix last night. Working hard. We just say it. Because we want people to know that we are working hard and we are hard workers. Oh, what you been up to? Man, I worked 17 hours yesterday. Listen, it's good to work hard. Do it and teach your children good work ethics. But when it comes to being a Christian, when it comes to our salvation, you don't work hard for that. Salvation is a free gift from God. In Titus chapter 3, it says that we are not saved because of the hard work and the work of righteousness that we do. We are saved through water of rebirth, which is baptism, and the free grace of God. That's how we are saved. So young people, you can see older, you know, adults in here just doing different things and, and all that. All these things, they are just a result of your faith. James said, faith without works is dead. They're just a result of your faith. But no one can work their way to heaven. That doesn't exist. You can't work enough for the church that God is going to give you a special place in heaven. That doesn't exist. We are going to have a room in heaven. Guess what? Your room might be bigger than mine, but I'm in heaven. I don't care. Okay? That's why Jesus Christ told the parable. He had a, 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 what was it, a vineyard, I believe, you know, and, and those people had been working in there for several hours. And one last person came work for like an hour. They always did the same thing. Oh, God, why? We would be mad. I worked 10 hours. I deserve more money than that person who worked one hour. Doesn't matter. We can't work our way to heaven. But guess what? Yeah, you need to work hard in this life. And your parents probably have told you that, have told you that, and will continue to tell you that. Get a job. Now, not only Paul, you know, said, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Not only Paul said, you were called according to his own purpose. You were called according to his grace. And understand that you can't work for grace. Okay, it's a free gift from God. Paul is also saying in verse 13 through 18 that, I'm sorry, you need to be loyal to the faith. Young people do understand what that word means. Loyalty is a very important concept in youth culture nowadays. Young people want to be loyal to their friends. Oh, my friend, I can't rat him out. You know, it's a good thing. They want to be loyal to, 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 their, to their homies. Whatever word that you guys use nowadays that are cool. They want their parents to be loyal to them. They understand what being loyal means. But something that I've realized is that young people don't really call it being loyal. Young people said being real. That's what they said. Oh, uh, you know, I mean, you got to be real. What does that even mean sometimes? I don't know. You know, they're talking about, oh, I don't like people being fake. You got to keep it real. You got to keep it 100. Like, really? Sometimes I'll be reading their tweets. I'm like, they're talking about people. It's all about keeping it real. It's all about keeping it 100. It's all about not being fake. I saw this on Twitter. Keep it 100, fam. We understand what loyalty means. 
And we want people to be loyal to us. They want people to be authentic. They want people to be loyal. Now, we all know that not everyone will be loyal to you. Young people, you know that. Not everyone will keep it 100 with you. Not everyone will be faithful to you. But I promise you, Jesus will always be a loyal friend. He will always be real with you. Jesus will always keep it 100. He will. He's not going to tell you things that you want to hear. He's going to tell you things that you need to hear. Things that you need in your life to succeed. He will keep it real with you. So Jesus wants you to be loyal to him. Be loyal to your faith. So how exactly do you do that? You know, what, what did Paul, Paul goes on to say, if you read verse number 12, Paul says, I want you to hold on to my teachings. Hold on. Timothy, you are my son. I'm your spiritual father. And I want you to hold, hold fast to what I have taught you. Paul told Timothy to hang on to what I've taught you. Do not let go. Hang on tight to the word of God. Hang on tight to my teachings because there's a journey coming ahead. You're going to need that. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years. Young people, you want to live long? Listen to your parents every now and then, okay? Parents, I hope you can look at your children this morning and tell them, hold on to what I've taught you. Can you say that to your children? Hold on to what I've been teaching you for the last 18 years of your life. I know these lessons weren't always pretty. I know this family went through some tough times and there were some hardships along the way. But hold on to what I've taught you in Christ Jesus. Parents, you teach your children. Your parents have taught you a lot, young people. Sometimes by lecturing you. Sometimes by yelling at you. Sometimes by having a conversation with you. Sometimes they're teaching you just by looking at you and you know they're saying something. And they want you to hang on to those teachings. But you know, something that I've realized, the lesson that Young people are most likely to never forget are the ones that they learn by your example. Not the ones that you say, you know, the words that you say all the time. Children might forget the lectures. They may forget the conversations. But most likely they will never forget what they saw you do in the home. I will never forget how my daddy used to wake up early in the morning and sneak in our room and put his hand over us and start praying over us. I'll never forget that. Sometimes we'll act like we're still sleeping just to listen to the words. That was nice. You know, an example that I try to do myself. I'll never forget how we used to wake up in, during summertime, everybody have to wake up early in the morning for us to have devotional. These are the things that I remember. Your children, they remember what they saw you do. They will remember how important God is to you based on how important, you know, how, how often do you go to church? Is coming to Bible class important to you? They will remember that. They remember what they saw you do. I will never forget how my mom used to go to work every day and yet come home and find time to cook for us. I will never forget that. Children are most likely to remember what they see. This guy said, religious life in the home is more influential than the church. I believe in that. No, parents, your children will never forget what they see as your work ethics. They will always remember how you treat each other in your marriage. They will remember how you love each other in the house. How you kiss your wife goodbye. Some of them might be saying, ugh. 
right now. But they will remember that. They will also remember how you fight all the time or not. They will remember seeing you pray. They will remember seeing you reading your Bible, helping other people in the community. These are the teachings that they will remember. You need to teach them by example. But young people, understand this. Your parents, they are not saints. Okay? I don't care what they've told you. They're not. I'm going to expose them this morning. Your parents are going to mess up. And most likely they already have. You need to allow them, give them the opportunity to apologize when they do so. And hold on to their godly teachings. The thing is, some of you are quickly realizing that you don't have your children for long. It seems like yesterday when some of them were born and here they are graduating, going to high school and getting married. You don't have them for long. You need to take the time and teach them every day. They are becoming their own person. Some of you sitting around looking at old photo albums and it's like, well, where did the time go? Jamal is eight. My wife said, you know, we're looking at pictures. It's like, oh, he was only two, two days old. No, well, he had to grow up. Time will pass by. We need to teach them every day. Hold on to the gospel of Christ, young people. Hold on to that. That's, that's the best thing I can tell you. I believe the gospel of Christ will guide you in your journey. Hold on to the teachings of Jesus. He will show you the way. Hold on to your salvation. You will make it to heaven, your home. Hold on to his grace. Last but not least, Paul says in chapter 2, be strong in his grace. Be strong in his grace. 2 Timothy chapter 2, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Why should you be strong? Because you must endure hardship as a good soldier for Christ. God asks us to be strong. Parents, you should tell your children, be strong. There are going to be some, some hard times ahead. Be strong. Be strong. You are going to make some mistakes. Be strong. Be strong. You, you, you are going to fall off the road and, and do certain things you know, that you may not like. Be strong. God can forgive you. God can bring you back. I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to be there for you. I'm always going to be a resource for you. Be strong. And hold on to the gospel. This morning, I just want to encourage you to be strong in his grace. As you guys are about to go to college, work, or do whatever's next in your life, just hang on tight to what the Bible says. That's the best companion you can have in your life ahead of this journey. Hang on tight to Christ. Hang on tight to the message of hope. And if there's anyone here this morning who haven't experienced the grace of God, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do so by responding to the gospel and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior through water of baptism. It is the best decision we can ever make. It's always so awesome to see a young person put on Christ. It's amazing to see a young person change their life. If there's anyone this morning who'd like to repent from their sin, who'd like to accept the grace of God, the water of baptism, we ask you to come forward. Let us stand and sing. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his words were the passion and purity. 
May his spirit divine all my being refine. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some words spoken that pierces you through and through, think how he was beguiled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to shows of day, in example and deeds and in all you say, lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to be sweet, let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Let us pray, guys.